Hey, Doc, it's Nick. Uh, got a case here that you're inquiring about um, upgrading the patient's aesthetics. Uh, so as you had indicated, it's a 30-year-old male, um, what we would call age-inappropriate wear. Uh, mild crowding, but that crowding in conjunction with um, envelope of function interferences, we've got quite a bit of wear. And as we know, when we have anterior interferences, um, that interfere with the envelope of function, we often have posterior problems too. So it's something I'm starting to notice what came first, the chicken or the egg conversation, at least with um, mutually protected occlusion. When I see interferences in the anterior, I often see uh, stuff happening in the posterior. And sometimes it's the joint. Uh, but you had said the joint was rather healthy in this case upon your evaluation. So kudos to you for uh, thinking outside the box and going a little bit behind, beyond uh, what the teeth present for us. So, really on first glance, this is a pretty straightforward Invisalign case. Um, before we talk about that, let's just get a quick sagittal diagnosis, class 2 molars, end on molars, um, class 2 canines. When you have class 2 and class 2, it's pretty common that you have uh, normal mesial distal width to the teeth and proper numbers of teeth in between the two. If you have a class 1 molar and a class 3 canine or some sort of discrepancy along those lines, uh, it's typically because there's something going on between, between the, the two teeth in the premolar region. Uh, I don't really get a sense here that there's a bolt and discrepancy um, in the anterior left side canine and molar class 1. When you have a class one relationship on one side and a class two on the other, you typically have a midline shift, uh, which is not surprising. Um, fixing midline shifts is, is challenging, but I think it's just important to kind of keep these things in mind because if I had a coincident midline, but the sagittal discrepancies were asymmetrical, then typically there's a reason why. Uh, but just looking at this patient's midline suture, it looks like the upper midline is, is where it needs to be. Uh, without photos, I can't say whether or not there's a problem there. <clears throat> it's not uncommon for patients to have a midline discrepancy up to four millimeters and have it still be rather aesthetic. Uh, Spear talks a lot about, I think it was Vince Kokich's study on midline aberrations. Um, moral of the story is if the midlines are vertical and upright, then being non-coincident is not really an issue. So I don't think treating this is necessarily something that you want to to try to attempt here, um, but it might happen organically as you unravel all of this, especially if you do a class two correction on this side. Uh, if you were to fix the class two here, Carrier would definitely help, uh, but this is a minor class two problem. You know, why do we fix class two situations? Well, it has to do with overjet. So I wouldn't really try to tackle the sagittal discrepancy unless you need to based upon how the teeth uh, end up when you send the clin check in. So what I would say first is get a clin check made where you uh, idealize the overbite and overjet of the anterior teeth, uh, improve the interincisal angle. Right now it's at 180 degrees. You want it somewhere around 135. Once that happens, if you are left with um, a non-ideal overjet and or overbite, then you can look at correcting the sagittal class two discrepancy on the right side. Now, if you're gonna do that, do you need carry A, considering it's that minimal? <clears throat> and I would say no here. Ro rotation of an upper first molar is a way to fix, I wouldn't say fix, uh, it's part of the solution of fixing sagittal class two situations. And you can see just based upon the, the shape of this tooth, if you rotate that simply by putting a four millimeter vertical button here, um, just by the use of the trays alone, you're actually going to get quite a bit of space. Um, <clears throat> so I would probably skip the KRA on this patient based on the fact that I don't think you're going to have that much of an overjet problem once everything is straightened. And then you also have the out of rotating this tooth without the use of the KRA. So I hope that makes sense. Let me know if it doesn't. <clears throat> and then your comment about this being a really good... Um, Filtech Supreme matrix system, Filtech matrix system uh, case, I absolutely agree. It's absolutely perfect. Um, 
But before we get there, I also want to bring to your attention the, the periodontal defects for a 30-year-old. Um, <clears throat> when you see periodontal defects, you have to ask why, and I think in this question we know it's based upon occlusal instability. Um, but one must ask the question, does this patient have a thin biotype? And if he does, what will orthodontics do to this patient? So I would say this is actually a high-risk perio patient, uh, combined by the fact that we're, we're already seeing a lot of clinical attachment loss, superseded by poor hygiene, as we can see with the gingival inflammation just generally throughout this guy's mouth, that if you start to unravel this, especially if you start to upright these teeth, we might bring the teeth outside the current alveolar housing, which might perpetuate the, the recession. So I would have the conversation with the patient that he's a high-risk perio patient. Your recommendation still holds true that he'd benefit greatly from having an optimized system. But in order to get there, we might have to uh, accept some periodontal compromise, which then could be treated at the end of treatment. Um, in the years, I've often sent these patients to the periodontist to get their get their thoughts, and nine times out of 10, um, as long as you have one to two millimeters of keratinized tissue, and when I say keratinized, I'm really saying attached and keratinized. Keratinized is the surface, the attached is the underlying connective tissue. Um, what I would do is find your mucogingival junction, find the distance to the gingival margin, you call that X, and then perioprobe. Uh, the perio probe should not go to the depth of X. If it does, it tells you that you don't have as much attachment here as you really want, which means it's more likely to be at risk for further fenestration of the, the gum tissue and or the bone. So let's just go over that again. Um, <clears throat> Mucogingival junction is essentially where the bottom of the attachment of the connective tissue attachment lives. Most people, that connective tissue attachment is a zone of one millimeter. Uh, before you get to the long junctional epithelium, which is another millimeter, and then you have your pocket at a millimeter. So really three millimeters is the standard zone here. So let's just say you measured from mucogingival junction to the gingival margin, you got three millimeters, and you probe at a millimeter, perfectly healthy periodontal apparatus around that tooth. It's at low risk for having further degradation uh, during orthodontic movement. Notice I said low risk, I'm not guaranteeing we won't have any issues. But if you probe here and you get three millimeters and the mucogingival junction is at three millimeters from the gingival margin, then you know you don't really have a whole lot of attachment here. And those are the very high risk areas uh, where you're, you're likely to move a tooth and all of a sudden have severe recession. Um, this guy right here looks like it might, might be a high risk for that. So assessing this patient's periodontal health before orthodontic treatment would probably be the uh, blind spot most likely not seen by many clinicians. Uh, so I'll advocate that you um, you really just kind of go through, make sure that you're you're measuring the zones of keratinized tissue and the um, degree of attachment that you have there around all of these teeth. Once you do that, educate the patient on the fact that they're gonna have to brush better in order to minimize the risk of periodontal compromise and then just let them know that after you're done the orthodontic treatment, any of the areas that are currently recessed and or become more recessed uh, can be treated through either connective tissue grafts or free gingival grafts, uh, either by yourself or the periodontist. Other than that, straightforward case, um, he kind of speaks to me as a airway patient, so I would just kind of knock on those, those doors a little bit. And then one thing I just want to make a note of Let's just say this patient didn't want to do anything. Um, very simple treatment plan you could present to him is to add composite to the canine, the upper canine, to disclude his very entrapped posterior teeth. So a little bit of a little bit of composite here um, gives the patient canine guidance, improves their mutually protected occlusion, and takes the lateral stresses off the posterior teeth that are. Uh, rather evident based upon the recession that you see and the wear facets. I'm just looking at this wear facet right here, and there, this, sorry, this wear facet right here, um, these shouldn't happen if the canine guidance is proper. Now the canine guidance is really dependent upon the position of these teeth in relation to their, 
uh, opposing tooth. So it's a it's a multifactorial um, consideration. With that said, I bet if you added some composite to the canine, either upper or lower and or lower, um, the patient would be protected a lot better than they are currently. Night guard also helps, but that's um, more of a band-aid than, than anything else. I'll wear a facet here. So good case, keep me posted. Let me know if the patient has any um, kind of issues with you know, these more higher level thoughts, especially the periodontal situation. Um, take care.